There's a phrase that we have all heard, Jesus is the reason for the season, right? We've all heard that and we believe that, that Jesus is the reason for the season. In a billboard, it says this, Jesus is a myth. Show some reason this season. The atheists or those that do not have faith in Christ will always try to belittle and to fairy tale the season of Christmas. They would like to think that if they could get the mindset of our culture today to look at Jesus and Santa Claus in the same mindset, that we all understand that Santa Claus, hold your ears if there's any little kids in here, is a myth or a fairy tale. But if we can get Jesus and Santa Claus on the same level, then Christianity becomes of no effect because it's not real. If we can get Christmas out of the lives of the baby Jesus being born for the sins of all mankind, if we can get Christmas about the presents and about the tree and about the food and about the entertainment, then we have lost the point of Christmas, and those that do not believe in Christ will have taken over the mindset of Christmas. The pagan religions, those that do not believe in Christ, will be nothing more than satisfied if Christianity and Christmas goes into the wind as a fairy tale and just a good holiday. Many of us growing up, Christmas was an event that we look forward to. Many of us didn't know Christ. We weren't believers in Christ, but we all celebrated the event of Christmas. Many times, many of us wake up in the morning and open the presents and had a good time, and we didn't understand what Christmas is all about. Many of us have never even experienced what Christ was all about, but we enjoyed the holiday. We could hear the stories, and, and we understood about the angels singing and, and Mary giving birth to Jesus. We didn't understand all that, but we've heard the stories over and over. Every year we come to this point of Christmas and this holiday season and we hear the stories. We understand that it took place 2,000 years ago. How could something that took place 2,000 years ago be relevant to us today? What was all that about? I just need us to take a minute and go back to that Christmas story. Go back to the event. And how can we put into application some of the characters and the events that took place 2,000 years ago and apply it to our life today. So I want to take some individuals and I want to give a principle, a principle that we can apply to our life right now. One of the main characters of the Christmas story is, of course, Mary. And here's the application. The impossible happens when you surrender to God's will. The impossible happens when you surrender to God's will. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Mary. There's three things that have to take place before God could ultimately use Mary is the vessel. The first thing, it has to be God's word. God's word. God prophesied ahead of time that there was going to be a birth, and this birth was going to be through a virgin, and that virgin was going to be the mother of Jesus. And when we have a decision that we have to make, these, th these three principles have to come into effect. The first thing is the word of God. God will never go against his word. God's word is paramount. It is it is, it is absolute truth. So when you're praying about something and the Bible says you shouldn't do something or you can't do this or God doesn't like this, it is absolute truth that we follow God's word. The second thing that has to take place is our will has to be lined up. Our will lines up and we follow after what God wants for our life, just as Mary did. What takes place is the will of God, the word of God, and the spirit of God starts working in our life. And the Holy Spirit of God comes into our life and it directs us and gives us 
uh, understanding of what God truly wants us to do. The supernatural, the impossible takes place. And I like what it said in Luke chapter 1, verses 34 through 38. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be as you have said. Gabriel said to Mary this, nothing is impossible for God. In faith, Mary submitted to God and gave permission for the will of God to take over her life. Now, she understood what this meant. She understood that she's going to be ridiculed. She's going to be kicked out. She could even be stoned. But she understood that if she was going to fulfill God's plan, God was going to have to protect her. And we can do great things with God. Nothing is impossible when we know that God is in the center of what he's asked us to do. The second character is Joseph. And Joseph, the, the mindset of this is the hardest, the heart, it is hard to trust God when God is working in the lives of our family and friends. When God is working in those that we love, it is hard to trust and it's hard to understand and it's hard to put in perspective when people are hurting or when God is using or when something is taking place and God is working in somebody's life and we see that and we love them and yet God is putting them through tests. Maybe they're going through some trials and we're sitting on the outside and we're looking in, how can we do something? And Joseph is, is probably a typical guy. He's, he's one of those strong, silent types. No, nothing in the Bible is recorded that Joseph said. It was, always, it was always something that he went through or what the angel said to him. Joseph wasn't really mentioned in the Bible. It was, it was something that he was, had this responsibility. He was a strong, silent type. He had the responsibility of training and raising the very Son of God. Could you imagine Mary comes up to him and says, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Joseph being upset, being mad. This is the woman I'm engaged to. How could this be? And he was so upset, he was even thinking about divorcing her or putting her away. They, the city folk were even thinking about stoning her. And he pondered this in his heart all night long. Anger. Being upset. And the angel Gabriel came to him in the middle of the night in a dream and said, Joseph, fear not. There it is again. Fear not. That which is conceived in Mary is of God. Take her unto your wife. And she is going to bear a son, and you need to call his name Jesus. Sometimes when we don't know what God is doing, what we can do is we can just go to God and say, God, I need your answers. I have all these questions, and I don't know what you're doing. And God sometimes makes us wonder. But he always gives us direction. He gives us peace, and he gives us understanding. At that time, Joseph took her, loved her, married her, because he was directed by God. And sometimes when you love something, and you see it going through problems or pains or trials, the best thing we can do is just ask God, God, give me direction, give me peace, give me understanding. I really don't know what's taking place, but I have to trust in you, and he will take care of us. And the third issue is the manger. The manger. God's presence changes the simple into the supernatural. You know, when, when we have a baby and, and uh, you're, you're getting close, what the moms do is they go to the store and, and they make the baby's room immaculate. Everything's new and everything's fresh. They paint the wall and, and they put the colors up and everything looks wonderful. They, they buy the radios. So, so when the baby's crying at 2 o'clock in the morning, all the men will get up and go take care of the baby at 2 in the morning. That's what we do all, I mean, I know that's what I had to do. I, I had to do that all the time. And, and the, the wives would sleep. So I didn't hear anything. I, I, you know, I, I just lovingly got up and took care of everything. And I changed the diapers. I fed the baby. I, I did whatever I needed to do. In, in our society, the room is, is immaculate. It's clean. It's pristine. The manger, 
the first breath of Jesus in humanity is the stench of animals. Filthy. Disgusting. If I was God, I'd have put Jesus in a palace. I'd have made it perfect. I'd have said, you know what, this is my son. I don't want anything to take place. He has a job to do, and that job, he is going to redeem mankind. I want to start when he's taken care of, but not God. He put him in a stable. He put him in a feeding trough. It wasn't a beautiful manger with hay and straw. It was a feeding trough. It's where the sheep and the camel and the goats and the cows just ate. They put some rags and they put him in a feeding trough. That doesn't make sense. God wanted to make sure that his son was brought to us in the very simplest, humblest form. God sent Jesus that was rich in everything. He was the son of God to be poor in a manger so we that are poor could accept him and become rich. God became us so we could understand what God needed and that is to redeem man back to God. He used it in a manger, the simplest form. It's good enough for the most simplest. It isn't for the rich. It isn't for the elite alone. It's for the rich, for the poor. But they all have to come to the same point. And Jesus used something that was so simple. And it became very supernatural. Now we look at the manger. We say the manger. We automatically think the birth of Christ. We automatically think about a beautiful manger with hay and straw and a little baby sitting in that manger. But really, that's not the way it was. It was a feeding trough. He had nothing. They were strangers in a land. But Jesus changes everything. When Jesus came into that stable, when Jesus was laid in that manger, Jesus, the very Son of God, changes everything everything once he enters and once he came in to that stable and once they laid him in that manger God's redemption plan was put into place it was all about that manger it was all about the start and what we see there is Jesus God became like you so that you can become like him God think about how this all started back in the garden of eden when sin entered into the world there was a rift between god and man sin broke fellowship and our sin breaks our fellowship with god and ever since the sin of the garden of eden god has been working on a redemptive plan to draw back sinful men to fellowship with god And because of that rift, because of that sin, God cannot, he detests sin. It broke that fellowship. So the creators of the world, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, in the creation of the world, created this, and God said, I have the plan. The plan was because men have sinned, I'm going to bring my son to this earth, born of a virgin. He's going to live 33 years, and he's going to die. And it's not about whether you're good or whether you're bad. It's not about what you do, and it's not about where you go. It's all about a point. Do you have faith that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you have faith that Jesus was born as sinless Lamb of God? He died to take away the sins of the world. He took your sins and my sins, and he buried it in the grave, and he arose 
the third day. And when he arose the third day, he had power over death, hell, and the grave. And when he had power, he arose into heaven, back to God, to tell God it is paid for. The greatest gift that you could ever receive is the gift of Jesus Christ. We talk about Christmas, we open our presents, we think, thanks for the present, thanks for what I got. We give our presents to individuals. The greatest gift ever given was given on that Christmas morning when Jesus was born in a manger. The greatest gift that you could ever receive is the gift of salvation when you say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. It is not a temporary gift. It is not something that you can unwrap and look at and enjoy for a time. Salvation is a gift that God wants to give to you that is eternal. You say, I accept Jesus for my sins. Forgive me what I've done. He gives to you the greatest gift of eternal life. Now, I understand the gift when we go to heaven. I understand we get to spend eternity with God. But the gift right now, to have communion to have fellowship with God. The greatest gift that I could comprehend, forgiveness of my sin. Many of us joke about, well, if I come into church, the whole roof would fall down. Well, there shouldn't even be a roof on this church then, okay? Because when we all walk in, we all have sin. We all have sin that God doesn't look at us. He looks at what he has done for us and he has nothing more than what he wants to do is take your sins forgive you of all of your sins past present and future sins and give to you the gift of eternal life that is what jesus is all about it's not about a fairy tale it's not about making it non-existent it's about understanding that jesus died for your sins and mine second corinthians 8 9 says this for you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. For your sakes. For your sakes. And the next character is the angels. The angels, the same thing as what we're talking about today, is good news. You don't have to be afraid. We can live our lives without being in fear. Now, I know in our culture today, there's always things that we're afraid of. We're afraid that things could take place. But as a, a follower of Christ, we can have confidence that Jesus knows what's best for us. Now, we may not understand everything that God does. There's a lot of times where we say, what is all that about? Why am I going through this? Or why is this taking place within our life? But we have to understand, just like the angels told Mary, just like the angels told Joseph, just like the angels told the shepherds, you don't have to be afraid. You are under God's protection. God loves you. God is going to take care of you. You don't have to be afraid. I want to give you good news. And that good news is Jesus is here for you. Jesus wants to take over your life. In uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 13 through 14, and suddenly there were an angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and earth, peace, goodwill to all men. When we say goodwill towards men, peace on earth, the angel is saying, okay, listen, the greatest event that has ever taken place, the most important event of mankind is taking place right now. It is God becoming man to redeem man from sin there was no access to heaven jesus had to be born in order for us to have access to god and the angels were saying listen the good news the gospel is being born the the prophecy is being fulfilled god has smiled on you you are going to see god in the flesh the angels proclaimed it. The angels understood it. But they showed it first to the shepherds. And the shepherds did this. God wants you to share the story of Jesus with everyone you meet. Could you imagine this a host of angels coming up? The shepherds were lowly shepherds. 
probably uneducated, and they were sitting out in the fields watching their sheep, taking care of them. They may have been in a cave, and they, they had been, you know, late at night. They were just out there doing a mundane job that they've done for all of their life. And all of a sudden, a multitude of heavenly hosts came out, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them. And they proclaimed, I have good news for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I like that. A Savior unto you. This Savior is born for you. The shepherds said, let us go to Bethlehem and see this Christ child. So they went to where the Savior laid and when they heard these things, they pondered them, and they looked at it, and they left saying, I'm going to tell everyone what I have seen and what I have heard. When we, enter, when we, um, when we come to the point that we are, are followers of Christ, and we see what Christ has done, our job, just like the shepherds, is to go tell people what Christ has done for us. Christmas is the event that we as believers should proclaim to everyone. Jesus is not a myth. Thinking about what Jesus has done for us, why is it that Christianity is so silent? We can play Christmas. We have no problem decorating for Christmas and open up the presents. But on Christmas morning, in the Christmas season, what we must do is we must proclaim the good news. We must tell the world that I am not ashamed of Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, verse 17, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about his child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They were amazed. So we need to go tell, just like the shepherds did. And then the star. When you honestly seek God, he will guide you to Jesus. Now, I understand this was a supernatural star because the Bible says that the star came to rest over where the child lay. This was a supernatural star. I want to put this into our day today. There are people that need guidance to Christ. There are people that you have sphere of influence over that need you to point them to Christ. God is utilizing the influence that you have to bring somebody to the knowledge of who Christ is. We have to take the initiative to allow Christ to open up that door, that defining moment in time where when that need is being, is being communicated and you are there, that you can be that divine star that is pointing people to Christ. We cannot be afraid to communicate the truth about what Christ has done for us. We cannot just say, I go to church. We cannot just say, I believe in God. We have to say, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. And simply tell the story of how Jesus radically changed your life. So often we as Christians say, I go to church. Or I believe in God. The devil his demons believe in God. It not, it's not good enough to believe in God. It's not good enough to go to church. What Jesus wants us to do, he wants us to proclaim the message because people are seeking and they're lost and they have no hope. And Jesus says, you, you are my star. You are my defining point of contact that when somebody needs Christ and you are in their life, why don't you draw them to Christ? And you don't have to know the Bible. You don't have to preach the Bible. All you have to do is share your story. What did Jesus do for you? And that star came to rest. And when that star came to rest, then here's what took place, the Magi. You are wise to bow down and offer Jesus your finest gifts. You know, we understand that this is um, some time after the stable. This is sometime after the birth, probably as much as one to three years after the birth of Jesus. 
So when you see the nativity scene, you see the wise men or the, or the magi there, it is not, they were not at the stable. This was at the house where the young child lived. But here's what they did. In, uh, verse, in uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, it says, Now when they when heard the king, they departed, and, be, and behold, the star which had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They hadn't even seen the baby yet. When they saw that the star rested over where the child was, with great anticipation, excitement, and joy. They were about ready to see prophecy fulfilled. They were about ready to see God in the flesh. And when they saw that the star came over and rested over the house, before they even went in, the anticipation and the joy and the excitement was so overwhelming. And so often when we, when we worship God, we, we worship Him out of duty. We don't get excited about what God has done. We go to church. We go to Sunday school. We open up the Bible. We pray. We preach. We teach. But sometimes because we've done it so long, it gets so mundane and there's no inner excitement. And I believe this is where God wants us to have a holy, powerful excitement within our life that I get to worship God. I get to have my sins forgiven. I need to understand what God gave to me as a gift of my salvation should be so overwhelming. When I preach or when I teach or when I talk or when I communicate, there should be a joyful excitement within our life. We shouldn't be a church full of dead bones Christians that just sit and look. We ought to be excited. We ought to worship God. We ought to proclaim his message. These wise men, these magi were going and they saw and worshiped Christ. Verse 11, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. The first thing they did, they saw the young child, and they fell on their face before God. God alone should be worshiped. They knew they could only do one thing. When we get to the point where we see God. And when we see God, we see who we are, and we see that I am a sin-filled individual. And the holiness of God, there's only one thing that we can do. Fall on our face before him. Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm not worthy of even looking at you. I'm not worthy of you blessing me. But when we fall on our face before God, we're saying humbly, God, I love you. God, you're the most important person in the room. Worship is having a heart totally abandoned of self and saying, God, you're the most important person. Whether I worship you in prayer or whether I worship you in song or whether I worship you in reading, in writing a poem, whether I'm talking about you, worship is when God and God alone is the object of your attention. And the Magi walked in there and they saw this little baby. They saw his mother. They said they fell down and worshiped. I have a question. When was the last time you worshipped? Not when was the last time you sang. When was the last time you worshipped? When was the last time God spoke to you? When was the last time that you saw your sinful need and you said, Lord, I need you. I, 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 have, I have goofed up. And you see Jesus whether it's through the word or whether it's through a song or whether it's through the Holy Spirit of God breaking your soul. And you don't care who's around you. You don't care if there's a packed house or you're in your closet. You fall on your face before God and say, Lord, forgive me. I can't do this without you. 
That's what the wise men did. When they saw Jesus, they saw who they were. And they understood who he was. And they understood that this is deity in the flesh. And they worshipped him. And then after they worshipped him, the Bible says, and when they had opened the treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Once we worship him, we have no problem with giving to him the very best things that we have. He wants our worship, first and foremost. But until we are willing to give him our hearts, we're not going to give him our gifts. If we give him our gifts without giving our hearts, then we'll do it out of a grudge. But if we give to him our worship, and we understand that the greatest gift that I have ever received is the gift of salvation, and I love what he has done for me, I can worship him, and I can thank him, and I can say, Lord, I understand that I couldn't get to heaven without you, and I understand that I am unholy, rotten. Within me, there's no good thing. But the gift that you gave to me, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of salvation, something I can't get on my own. Even the word born again, it's a new term in the Christian realm. Born again. What does that mean? That means I can't get to heaven on my own. I can't be saved on my own. There is no thing about getting doing better or doing worse. I can't get there, and neither can you. You can't join enough churches to go to heaven. The only person that you have to do, you have to fall on your face before God and worship him and accept him as the true and only gift of salvation. And then what happens when you do that? I, I believe this is really neat. In verse 12, once we've worshiped him, once we've accepted him, once we've given to him our gifts, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Here's what I believe. I believe those wise men, they came and they did what God wanted them to do. He set a star in the sky, a star that settled over the house where the young child was. They came in with a joyful anticipation and excitement. They opened the door and they saw the baby Jesus and they fell on their face before God and they worshipped him. And because they were excited about what God was doing within their life and because they worshipped him and because everything that they had, they gave to him. Here's what I believe uh, what God did. I believe God supernaturally empowered them and blessed them. Being divinely instructed in a dream. Why is that? Because God could count on them to be faithful because they were excited about what God is doing within their life, because they worshiped him and they gave to him. I believe God's hand moves on people that worship and honor God. I do believe that. I believe that when we don't worship God and we don't sacrifice for God, God is saying this, the biggest, most important event that I gave to you is the birth of my son. He died on the cross. All you have to do is worship him. All you have to do is accept him, but you reject him. And there's going to be a day that Jesus will reject those that have rejected him. I believe Jesus, God, blesses those that worship him. I believe his hand is on people that worship him. Why? is because they understood that God and God alone is worthy to be praised. And when we worship God, he is saying this, it's not about me. It's all about God. It's all about God. And I believe God does great things when he sees the heart of individuals that's not afraid to show that Jesus is the reason for this season. Jesus. Died. 
on the cross for you. Born unto you in the city of David is a Savior, the Christ the Lord. The angels proclaimed what we need to believe 2,000 years ago with exceedingly great joy. The wise men walked in that door with anticipation of what they're going to see. When they saw the greatest event of history unfold before them, they saw God in the flesh. They fell on their face and worshipped. This Christmas season, we need to worship. Christmas morning, we need to worship. We don't need to just open up our presents and use Christmas as an event. We need to proclaim Jesus. It's his birthday. It is the greatest event in human history. If it wasn't for the birth, we would never have the cross. Pundits would tell you it's a fairy tale. People that have no faith in Christ would say it is just a holiday. But a believer in Jesus Christ would say, no, that's my Savior. And upon this fact, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. It's time that we confess his name. It's time that we worship his name. It's time that we honor his name. They fell on their face before Jesus and worshiped him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to ask Joey and, or Justin to come up and um, play a song. I believe that worship is something that is very important to us. So when we worship him, when we pray to him, it's putting God where he needs to be. And I want to have a word of prayer and then I want to offer you an opportunity to worship. Just between you and God. A holiday season of understanding exactly what Christ has done. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, I pray that you'll be with our church. I pray that you'll be with every believer. That we can be so full of joy and excitement about what you are doing within our life, what you want to do within our church, what you want to do within our families is so awesome. But Lord, what you really want from us is to be honestly open and transparent in our worship. Let us worship your name. Let us honor forgiveness. Let us honor your love. Let us give to you what you want. And that is, when we seek after you and we see you, we are so overwhelmed that we just want to worship you. I pray that today we can do that. We will honor you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.